It's Tuesday morning, 9.30 a.m. in Central Europe. It's an unusual Space Café web talk time today. Our Space Café web talk, 33 minutes with Alice Gorman, will begin soon. A very happy new year to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us for a talk today about the moon. So we thought it would be a nice start um, to start. It would be nice to start in a region where we left the last year, so in Australia. And thank you also for your flexibility to join us at this hour here. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. I'm Torsten Greening, your host today and publisher of Spacewatch.global. We are a Europe-based online platform for information in about space and new space activities, as you all know. I would like to thank all our supporters that showed their commitment in the last month. We really, really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, the bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. Our latest episodes features ESA's project manager for the James Webb Space Telescope, Peter Rumler, on the day of the launch. I mean, what an incredible experience to do that podcast production on that day and of course for you also to listen to that so that's fantastic and for all our fans of online not online audio content we also have new episodes in the space cafe radio so emma's so dr emma gatti's top 10 space events in 2021 and a number of great reviews so and as i see uh, malcolm in the house um he also contributed to the review series are in a really absolute fantastic way. Um, and some news, we have the Space Cafe radios now also available on all major podcast platform. Just search for Space Cafe radio. And we also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a space watcher. I already talked about our supporter program, so um so to keep our independent work alive and if you've missed any of our previous web talks we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on youtube so i'm super excited today uh to talk with my guest today so and you can see i'm pretty nervous for whatever reason but i am so after starting the last year um, last year, 21, a space cafe about war in space with a fantastic Doug Lavero. I'm so happy to start 2022 with something I just love to do, talking about the moon. Um, and I could not think about anyone more appropriate than my guest today. Many of you know her as she is the voice for the moon and for heritage. You may know her also by her Twitter handle, Dr. Space Junk, and with that, a very, very warm welcome, Professor Dr. Alice Gorman. So, and I just have to say it once because we are, I'm German, so, and we love this title. So, um, Alice is an associate professor at the Flinders University and an internationally recognized leader in the field of space archaeology. And what that is, we will talk about later. Her research focuses on the archaeology and heritage of space exploration, including space junk, planetary landing sites, off Earth mining, rocket launch pads, and antennas. She is a senior member of the American Institute of Astronautics and Aeronautics, other way around and the former deputy chair of the Space Industry Association of Australia. And her award-winning book, Dr. Space Junk versus the Universe, Archaeology and the Future, was published in 2019. And I mean, even it was published two and a half years ago, I really recommend you to, to go for this book. I mean, it's at least worth the title, what is so cool um, and I admit I haven't read it, so but Alice, big promise, I will do so very, very soon. Again, Alice, a very warm welcome to our Space Cafe today. 
Hello, Torsten. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's thank you for those very kind words of welcome. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to be here in the first Space Cafe of the year. And I'd like, first of all, to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the lands of the Wiradjuri people. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge their ongoing connections to the cultural heritage of their lands, waters and skies. And I also extend my respect to the traditional owners of all of the different countries that, that our audience is joining us from today. And I Thank will also that. add, it's very hot here at the moment. So please do forgive me if I have to pull my fan out from time to time. No problem at all. So let's start. I mean, can you clarify for us what is space archaeology? And I mean, in our pre-talk, I made this mistake that I mix it up with something completely different. And so I'm thinking I'm not the only one. It's so, so niche and so specific. So please enlighten us. And as we stick with the, with the lightning thing later on. So I think that's good to start with. This is true, Torsten. It is a little bit confusing, first of all, because people tend to think of archaeology as the study of very ancient things. And when you put it together with space, which is very much here and now and sort of edging into the future, that does seem a bit counterintuitive. But basically, space archaeology is the study of all of the, the objects and the places that are associated with the human movement into space. So this means launch sites, tracking stations, antennas, research and development locations on the surface of the Earth. It means everything that is in Earth orbit right now, all of those rocket bodies and space stations and satellites and space junk, all of the landing sites on planetary bodies throughout the solar system and deep space probes like the Voyager 1 and 2, currently outside the solar system, the Parker Solar Probe, that's mm -hmm. currently very close to the sun. So this, so basically, space archaeology studies all of the material things that humans have left behind in the solar system. So some people say, well, this is trash, but that's what archaeologists do. We study the stuff that people discard and leave behind to find out what it can tell us about human behavior. Now, there's another area of study, I guess you could say, that people sometimes also call space archaeology. And this is the use of satellites uh, providing Earth observation imagery that allows you to look at ancient sites on Earth. Mm -hmm. So while it's using uh, space-based data, it is actually terrestrial archaeology because it's looking at um, sites on Earth and it's kind of the same as, you know, archaeologists have been using um, aerial imagery and now drone imagery and satellite imagery for a long time. So sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. So, so those kinds of archaeologists are using the satellites, where, whereas I'm studying the satellites. Interesting, very, very interesting. And I, we, we will dig into it a little bit later. And for all of you that might say, hey, what is this cool star map that is behind Alice? We asked this question prior to the show. It shows direct behind her the asteroid named by her. So, and we see it now, so it comes close. So it's not a live map, so it's, it's, it's really just a page. But just for the clarification, if you try to discover some of the star signs. However, so also in our pre-talk, you mentioned um, a text or a phrase from Earth, thrown off no what is it um oh torsten game of thrones you know what Thrones. game of thrones game of thrones so that's that's that story and yes i haven't seen it before so forgive me for that so and the phrase what what is that can't never die so and i learned it in the context of this question is why does it make people angry to say that the moon isn't dead and with that of course or the question how do you find define that this this is a really interesting thing to me and this is why that, that game of thrones phrase which is kind of the the motto of one of the the great houses and don't worry if you've never seen game of thrones but so what is dead may never die and it seems like a paradox so so if something's already dead how can it die again and of course 
you know, there are lots of things that are sort of dead and not dead um, that people love to to watch, like zombies and vampires and and things like that. But to me, it raises a really interesting question because there's a whole lot of things in space that are treated as if they're dead but you could argue that there are many many shades of existence between like living as a kind of a biological sentient being as we are right now and and being an asteroid or a moon or uh, a spacecraft that's not currently being used and is technically defined as junk so Something I've noticed uh, ever since I've been taking an interest in the moon, like my, my primary interest in the moon is the, the cultural heritage aspects of all of the human mm. landing places, uh, robotic and, and crude uh, on the moon since 1959. But this has kind of led me to try and think about the moon as a place. And since I started working on the archaeology of the moon, of course, you know, nothing was happening for a long, long time. And now suddenly everyone's going to the moon. They're going to extract resources for, uh, you know, in situ resource utilization. They're planning surface missions. They're planning habitats. They're thinking about mining the moon's resources and using them to get to Mars. So, and this has all happened like in the last five years, I guess. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty rapid nothing for such a long time since um, the Apollo missions. But in the discourse around using the moon's resources, people are saying we can do this because the moon is dead. And the moon is dead because it has no life that belongs to it or anything that's living on the moon and has died on the moon and things have died on the moon mm -hmm. has been introduced by us. So, so the moon is dead, therefore we can't kill it. It's already dead. There's nothing we can do to it to make it any worse off, if you see what I mean. Okay. And for me, that's where, why that little phrase, what is dead may never die, suddenly becomes relevant. Uh, but people get, well, first of all, I guess, I would argue that the moon is not dead. The moon is seismically active. The moon has, as we're learning, as more and more studies are being done, the moon has active water cycles. Sure, they're not based around oceans and rain like they are on Earth. They're based on, on you know, more, um, less wet interactions with cosmic rays and solar flares and micrometeorites and all that kind of stuff. But we, are, we know that water forms and dissipates and reforms on the moon. And we need to know about this because this is the target everyone's looking at, the water ice. So there's so much we don't know. And the moon is engaged. It's not just floating around inert in its orbit. It is vitally engaged with the Earth. We know this, tides, everyone knows this, and with the rest of the solar system, it's in a, in a dynamic interchange with the cosmos. So is this really dead? I would argue not. But what's mystifying to me is why it makes people angry to say that the moon is not dead. And um, I find this happens most often on social media. And if I post anything about the moon being more complex than just a, a, a dead rock, I get all these responses of people being actively, not just disagreeing with me, they're angry at me. And how I reason this at the moment is if you say the moon is dead, then you have no moral obligation towards it. So saying that the moon might have its own ecosystem and its own um, you know, distinct existence as a dynamic entity means, damn, we have to stop and take a step back and think about what we're doing. It's not simple anymore. So I think that's part of it. Another part of it, I think, is, and I'm going to be honest here, this kind of reaction of anger is most often coming from men that I'm interacting with in social media. And there's a lot of research which has shown that 
certain sectors of the male population find any interest in environmental consciousness or sustainability uh, to be, you know, that's what, that's girly and feminizing mm. and it cannot be entertained. So to be interested in environmental management or preservation or to conceive of something as having some environmental values is actually, you know, um, it's a bit of a threat. So look, I don't know, um, I'm sure it's much more complex than that. Those are just the things that have occurred to me, but I've never had any discussions about any aspect of space. Well, actually hardly any discussions about, because the other thing that made mm -hmm. people very angry was when I compared Elon Musk's red sports car in space to certain cultural tropes. So those are the two things that have made people angry. And I just find that a really interesting cultural phenomenon. Yeah. I think what you descri describe is the uh, one of the issues that we have with social media for all the good things that, that we can achieve with that is that everyone has access and it's not controlled. And yeah, so yeah. I mean, we yeah, don't have sorry. to go into details that we have here on Earth. I mean, we see with the current pandemic, we know about we see all this demonstration from people against that. But that's that's another topic. And I don't want to encourage the men here in the in, in, in the room to give their opinion or if you agree with with Alice or not. But feel free uh, if you like to use our chat or give us your comment uh, if you are angry as well that the moon is might be not dead. So um so i would like before we then go really into our um, even more complex topics and i think that's that's highly complex already um one of your what is very close to your heart is this moon poetry as it describes what we think about it so if you would like to shed a light on that and give us one of your favorites before we then dig into the dark uh, well, I'm hoping you will indulge me and let me have maybe two tiny poems. Is sure. The reason I'm very interested in poetry about the moon is, is I think we need different and new and richer language to describe the moon. Uh, and, and I think this means the engagement of a whole range of different kinds of people with different mm -hmm. approaches. And, and so I often think about poetry about the moon and uh, two that I would love to share with you. One is a little excerpt from a, a poem by the Australian poet and writer Keridwen Dovey called Moonrise, uh, which is spoken from the perspective of the moon. And these lines just send chill chills down my spine. So I am made of much more disturbing stuff, seas of death, bays of lunacy, craters of indifference to human time. And that's part of a much longer poem that I hope will be published at some point. Mm -hmm. And the other lunar poem that Wonderful. at the moment is one of my favorites is by Christine Reuter, who's a, who's a space poet She's and an artist. And she does these wonderful illustrations. You might know her on Twitter as Tico Girl and her website has just some wonderful stuff in it. And this little short poem is about, it's written from the perspective of someone who lives on the moon. And they've just popped back to Earth for a little visit or a holiday or something. So this is the poem, Crescent Home. You've only been away a week, and yet you stare at the Terminator on your crescent home, and a shadow falls across a place you know. And Good I just I find the, the intimacy of that poem and, and the fact that it mentions shadows to be quite a wonderful way of describing longing for a place that we don't yet call home. No one calls the moon home yet, but one day they might. And I mean, you mentioned before the moon comes back now in a rapid speed into back in, into our focus. Uh, what cultural heritage significance have the shadows in that case of the Apollo moon landing sites? So if we start on, on, on that angle. 
this I, I have to confess that I have developed quite an obsession with shadows of all kinds. And this, when I was thinking about particularly the Apollo sites on the moon, uh, six of which were created between 1969 and 1972, um, about 10 years ago, NASA created a set of guidelines uh, to recommend to, to people doing stuff on the surface to protect these sites. And part of that was creating buffer zones around them, sort of like exclusion zones. You can't go inside these zones or you risk uh, stirring up a lot of dust and damaging them. And I was thinking about this and I thought, well, it's important that these buffer zones catch every part of the site. And then it occurred to me that some parts of the site, in fact, are not tangible because the shadows cast by the, the landing modules, the experiment packages, you know, the abandoned rovers are a thing in themselves, a, a cultural product in themselves that might have heritage significance. So this led me to start thinking about what these shadows mean. One thing is that the shadows are cast are very distinctive. So, so they're often highly angular and geometric in a way that naturally occurring shadows on the moon tend not to be. And there's also things like uh, some of their communication antennas were made of mesh and the shadows they cast are sort of uh, light and lacy. So that's not, there's nothing on the moon that we know of that could cast a shadow like that. So these shadows are very distinct things in their own right. And of course, we know that as the Terminator passes over the moon, or at least I think this is now sort of established, it causes the highly charged lunar dust to levitate. So in the, the very complex machinery that humans have left on the moon, there's probably little microclimates uh, that are activated every time the Terminator passes, little sort of tiny dusty maelstroms inside little nooks and crannies uh, of all of the, the stuff that's on there. So the shadows form part of uh, these, these little heritage microclimates, I guess you could say. So there's, for me, there's just so many levels that make the shadows significant. And, and of course, uh, one thing is we, we, we know that things like the recon Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has uh, seen the shadows cast. We know that, well, the lunar conspiracy theorists don't agree with this, but we, we know that people really did go to the moon because the shadows cast by all of this stuff can, were seen and imaged by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So those shadows are a sign. They're a sign of human presence. And, and they could be a sign that it all really happened if, if you were of a, a mind to believe that. So for me, the shadows cast by human materials on the moon just have so many levels of complexity and meaning mm. okay interesting and interesting thoughts uh one thing that stri strikes me with, with all your explanation is if we want to know more about it we have to go back so we create more remains of us i mean we can't be so sustainable that we take it all back and even so we will leave something on it as a food step art steps or whatever things from 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 the from the experiments yeah. is it something good or bad or is it question too easy <laughs> that's it's that's a really hard so from my perspective the stuff that's left behind is the stuff i want to study so of course i want people to treat it with respect and care as well and indeed, if we if we were looking from a future perspective, we're looking at the archaeological record left on the moon, it ought to be possible for us to tell that there's a changing point. There's a point at which attitudes to the moon changed because we see that reflected in what is left behind and how it's treated, uh, you know, in the reuse of materials, in the, in the design of installations and, and things like that, we ought to be able to discern 
uh, changing attitudes to the moon such that um, you know people are that that trying to use the moon sustainably ought to be visible in the archaeological record record. So part of me is that's all fine because that's all part of what happens. That's that's just uh, human culture operating as it normally does. Another part of me thinks, so, I mean, we're part of this universe, this solar system, this, this earth moon system. We're not separate to it. I do absolutely want us to exercise our moral and ethical obligations to other planetary bodies and their environments. But we also can't pretend to st st tread lightly and never leave any trace and it's okay to interact with these other environments that that our lives are part of i think that's also okay i think what's not okay are the values and the attitudes we bring with us when we go into these other places so you would some well some people accuse me of wanting to let no one go to the moon ever and i don't feel like that but uh i i do feel that there's a very strong discourse at the moment, which is based around this idea that the moon is a dead rock that we can do anything to because nothing matters when it comes to that. And I think we need to pull that discourse back. We need to provide some counterweights to balance that. I think heritage can be part of that discourse. And I think, uh, well, I think we may be going to mention the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon later. But I think that's also absolutely. part of that yeah, discourse. Absolutely. But before we go to the declaration, I would like to stay in the shadows because that it's, I know something what is, what is very important for you as well. And we're talking here about the PSR, the permanent shadow regions, a new abbreviation I just learned. So what is this natural heritage significance? And we, we start from there and it will be a more detailed conversation on this, on this topic. Um, so what, what is so important? The, the permanently shadow regions or, or PSRs, these are at the lunar north and south poles. And these are places where there are craters, which we now know are filled with water ice. And this water ice is at the moment, the main target for lunar mining because it will provide fuel for lunar operations, maybe to go on to Mars. The reason there is such a quantity of water ice in the permanently shadowed regions is because they are permanently shadowed. The sun has not shone in these deep craters in the lunar south pole for two billion years. And when I learned that, and I learned this because I was on my shadow trail, I was chasing down anything to do with shadows on the moon. I just thought that's extraordinary, two billion year old shadows. How common is that in the solar system? So. It turns out not that common. So there are permanently shadowed regions on Ceres, which is a, a, a asteroid or a, a little tiny planet in the asteroid belt, and also on Mercury. But there's not that many in the whole solar system. So this is a rare landscape type. And it just also strikes me as an extraordinary thing. So the only light these shadows have encountered in two billion years is starlight. There has been no sunlight. And that's another thing that just, just I think that's so extraordinary. I think we can't just go there and mine willy nilly without taking those extraordinary environmental values into account. But there's also, Am I allowed another poem? Have we got time for a third poem? Actually... We take this time. I mean, it's, it's, it's a morning hour at CSO. Who cares uh, about time when you have fun? It's not just a natural heritage values in the permanently shadowed regions. There is actually an archaeological site at the Lunar South Pole. So in uh, 1998, the Lunar Prospector mission was launched by NASA. And in fact, it's one of the ones that started to give us data about the water ice, the possible water ice in this region. And uh, the year before, uh, an extraordinarily extraordinary planetary scientist, uh, Eugene Shoemaker, was very sadly killed in Australia uh, as he was on his way to investigate a crater. And when the Lunar Prospector was launched, it took with it 
um, uh, wrapped around and a little brass plate wrapped around the body. It took another poem as a memorial to Eugene Shoemaker. And this was uh, uh, from Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. And I'm gonna read you what was written on the Lunar Prospector. Uh, and when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars. And he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. So the Lunar Prospector crashed on in 1999. And there is amongst the permanently shadowed regions a, a cultural heritage site that is very meaningful for people on Earth. Oh. And I think that extract from Romeo and Juliet uh, with its reference to the night and the sun is, is perfectly fitted to the permanently shadowed regions. Let's jump into the brutal reality. Who can go there? Who can, who has the right to go there, illuminate a light and do observation, excavation? Yeah, or I mean, you talked about the resources and uh, we will, uh, we, we do have a number of space lawyers are in, in, in the room here um, as, as well. Uh -oh. So I'm, I'm not just <laughs> warning you, just, just want to mention that, but I mean, there are the agreements that we have that might or might not have been are assigned. So, but is there anything what protects them? Or is it just your strong will? <laughs> um, well, at the moment, no. Um, mm. So yeah. some of our interactions with the moon are guided by the planetary protection policy. And to date, this has very much for, and it, it's, um, uh, created and maintained by the Committee on Space Research, COSPA. Uh, it has to date focused very much on protecting potential life in other places in the universe. However, uh, there are now discussions around, uh, you know, whether there are other aspects of planetary environments that require some level of protection. So that, those kinds of discussions are being had, which I think is really important. Uh, there's also... Um, things like the, the Hague Building Blocks, which was the, the sort of principles document produced by the Hague Working Group on um, stuff. Uh, and these are, are very important. So they recognize that there are natural and cultural heritage values on the moon. There's also the Vancouver recommendations on space mining, uh, which recognize that there are natural values as well. Uh, so at the moment, so, so because the Outer Space Treaty says that, that you know, space is accessible and belongs to everyone, um, technically anyone can go there. And we're sort of an environment where it's also being accepted that resources can be extracted and used by people who do that. So the current state of play is, yes, anyone can go there and use those resources. We have those guiding principles and there may at some point, and people are starting, and I find this very heartening, people are starting to think about natural environmental values. So these kinds of discussions, I think, will very much be part of how people go there and uh, use these or, you know, carry out activities in these landscapes. If we take our own history experience that we have here on Earth and how, in what speed we start to destroy or we have destroyed our Earth. I mean, it needs a lot of positive energy to, to think that we will not repeat this wherever we go on the moon, on Mars or wherever, because, hey, we, as you said before, we want to make it potentially our home. So we have to, to form it like we want it. And I mean, that never turned out to, to the good, uh, not mm -hmm. living together in harmony with the environment. Um, due to the time, and we have to look at it because it's 33 minutes, even it's a 33 minute plus today. Um, tell us a bit more about, and you mentioned before the declaration of the rights of the moon, please. I mean, that's an initiative <laughs> you, you pushed for. Tell us more about it and how people can engage, how can people support that? 
So the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon kind of arose out of a series of discussions um, between um, a, a, a few of us. So, so the us are um, Thomas Gooch, uh, who was the Australian representative of the Moon Village Association, uh, Keridwin Dovey, whose who's wonderful work I have already uh, alluded to, Michelle Maloney, who is an environmental lawyer working on the rights of nature, um, and Mari Margul, who is a, a similar person working on the rights of nature. And we were talking about what was going to happen on the moon. And the idea came up that we needed um, a declaration of the rights of the moon because no such declaration existed. It seemed like such a simple thing just to set out what rights does the moon have. So over a period of, well, um, I, I think it was about a year, we kind of nutted out the principles we thought were important. One thing we did think was incredibly important was that uh, really the, the stakeholders in the future of the moon are the entire population of Earth. So really everybody should have a say, but mm -hmm. to get, you know, you'd need funding to, to take a survey of all of the people of Earth. And there might be other questions people think, think are a bit more important to answer than that. But we basically thought, look, someone's got to do it. It might as well be us. So let's, let's just write it and put it out there and see what happens. So that's what we did. So in, in um, about a month's time, it will have been in existence for a year. And it is, as I said before, we don't think space companies, commercial operators are going to read the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon and so say, oh, my God, we have to stop everything we're doing and not go there. The moon is too important. That's not what we think is going to happen. What we do think is we've raised some issues that need serious discussion and we have provided a counterbalance to the current discussions, which are very much hyper-capitalist and which are um, regarding it as inevitable, absolutely inevitable that all of this will happen. Well, it isn't inevitable. And it's very important, I think, to have other voices out there. And this is where we see the declaration fitting. So you, if you search for it, you can find it on the website. I'm just going to give you two key rights that we identified that the moon has. One is the right to maintain ecological integrity. And the other is the right to remain forever a peaceful celestial entity unmarred by human conflict and warfare. And I'm pretty sure most people would think that the right to remain a peaceful uh, celestial entity is something they can get behind. So whatever else you think of the, the rights, the Declaration of the Rights of the Moon, uh, I'm pretty sure most people would get behind that one. Um, I'm happy to put a, a, a link to the, the website in our, our follow-up emails to, to our audience to have oh, a deeper you. look into that. And our, of course, we are very happy if, if there's anything where we can help with to, to get the word out, uh, because it's a, it's, it's a good thing. So um, I would like at least to have a chance to get one of the questions here answered, and I know it's hard, we're hard on time. I'm, and all your questions are, are wonderful, and we will send them over to, to Alice and ask her to, to answer them in writing um, then later on. But Malcolm's question are, I think, spurred on this very interesting uh, thought. If the moon isn't dead, as you are arguing, then neither is the Earth, very obviously. So how do we equate human activities on Earth with future human activities on the moon? Hmm. It's a typical Malcolm question, I would say. Yeah, so <laughs> we need another half an hour to discuss about it. So. So, well, Malcolm is absolutely right. The Earth is not dead. Uh, you could argue that human activities on the moon are in fact bringing life to the mm. moon to join the other dead things. We have semi-alive tardigrades encased in resin. And we have dead seedlings, and I think there were some insects on Chang'e 3. 
tardigrades. So what? No, it was not the yes, Everybody knows about the tardigrades. <laughs> yeah, of course. But they're, they're, um, they're technically not quite alive. So, so, I mean, this is, it's an interesting thought that maybe one day people are going to be growing things in lunar regolith. And, and we're going to change the balance of uh, the, you know, the, the chemical composition of the moon. Uh, so I think, I think acknowledging that being defined as alive or dead is a lot more complex than um, just there are living things present um, and how they, I mean, we know we're, we're going, are we going to turn the moon into a cyborg? Uh, it's become a, a, a cybernetic entity um, because we're meshed into the moon. Are we already that on Earth? I think I'll just have to, to grab that Malcolm and um, take him down the pub and continue this conversation. Um, happy to be present in the, in the pub and, and, and broadcast that, of course. I'm afraid we have to come to an end. I mean, I'm getting warning signs from our production team that we are over and over and over. Sorry, and sorry, sorry, However, sorry. it was great. It was so great. I really en enjoyed it. So, um, but that's not the end, as we all know. Um, before we finish today, please do not miss next week. Uh, my new guest will be Professor Dr. Anke Kaiser Pizzala, uh, and she is the head of the DLR here in Germany. Um, that was with an interesting talk, talk um, with her about the research of DLR and what they do for climate change. Then on the 13th, um, we host a program and that's called Does Outer Space Need Arbitration by Laura uh, Zielinski in, uh, in Mexico. So Stephen, uh, Franz van der Dunk and others will be there and I can tell you, if you want to be there live in person or in the room, hurry up because we are running out of space. Or so we have a limited license on our, on Zoom, but here I can say we are starting running out of space. So on the 16th, uh, no, on the 18th, um, I have the pleasure talking with Peter Hulsroy, and then on the 25th I will be live at the EU Space Conference in Brussels. Fingers crossed are to talk with one of the represents there. And also on the 27th, we have the next Space Law Breakfast. And on that occasion, I hand over to your host for this Space Law Breakfast to Stephen, if all of our technical setup worked here now. Are you there, Stephen? I am, Torsten. Can you hear me? <laughs> And we can hear you very well. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. What a wonderful discussion between two amazing humans and humanists. And just indulge me for one second, Alice, because your discussion about the moon being alive. So we are down uh, on the south coast in uh, just below Sydney, and we're staying at a place right on a river, which is really, really strong tides. And we were in the water this morning, Donna and I, floating with the tide and of course the tides as you said are all about the moon and we were literally being pulled by the moon we were falling towards the moon um in these tides you know that was our feeling so you know the moon is just so essential for everything on life and so it was a wonderful discussion but that's not what you wanted me to say <laughs> yes on the 27th torsten um we've got our next space law breakfast um, we will be in a wonderful cafe in Singapore uh, with two incredible guests. So Torsten and I will be hosting uh, Guyo Wang from China, who is uh, such a knowledgeable person about all things related to space. He was is also involved in the Hague Working Group um, that Alice referred to. And uh, our other guest will be Geraldine Go Escobar, uh, from, well, she's originally from Singapore, now from The Hague, who has had an incredible career space related in a whole range of ways. And we'll be talking about um, near collisions. That's very much in the news at the moment. We'll be talking about AI in, in space technology. We'll be talking about the point that Alice made about civil society and everybody and all stakeholders having a voice. So please join us, join Torsten and I, 
if you can, on the 27th, the details are on the screen. Thank you again. This was a great discussion. Back to you, Torsten. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so all these events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And as always, oh, I'm switching here. See, uh, As always, we would like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Just also let us know who you like us to talk to, or if there's any favorite you have in mind that we didn't thought of. So and don't forget to sign up to our daily and bi-weekly newsletters. If you like to treat yourself with something special, become a space watcher today or help us in the supporter program. So, and thank you very much again, Alice, for this really inspiring and thoughtful talk and being my guest. And thanks again to this entire team behind the scene doing their, their great job week by week. And as we will uh, do all these space cafes as smooth as we have conducted the 92 space cafes in the last year are also this year. So thank you very much. I hope you all will stay safe and stay healthy. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you next week. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you very much. Alice, thank you.